practical innovation for climate action, lessons from water and sanitation. We're really pleased that you've been able to join us at the UK Pavilion today for this vital discussion. To kick us off, we're going to have a video uh, from the Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell, Minister of State for Development in Africa from the United Kingdom. So let's watch this video and then we'll get started with our live speakers. Thank you all for coming today. And thank you to Sanitation and Water for All, WaterAid, the Asian Development Bank, and all our panelists for your support and wisdom. I am very sorry that I cannot join you in person. The climate crisis we are facing is immense. And what the WASH sector knows better than most is that for many poor people, the climate crisis is a water crisis. From the worst drought to hit Somalia in 40 years, to devastating floods affecting much of West and Central Africa, to outbreaks of cholera extending from Malawi to Lebanon, more frequent extreme weather, and the spread of water-related diseases are painful reminders that the climate crisis is affecting us now. We also know that women and girls in the developing world are on the front line and are often its first victims. So as we meet to develop and implement climate policies and plans, we must have a greater focus on their needs and perspectives and learn from their knowledge the centers of their communities, which is what the COP Gender Day is all about. We must correct the gender imbalances in our existing approaches if we are to protect communities, livelihoods, and the environment. In this respect, the WASH sector has often led the way, using the wisdom and insight of women to shape the climate conversation and sharpen our responses. Today is about sharing that learning and putting women at the heart of the global response to climate change. I wish you all the best. Okay, thanks to His Excellency for those remarks. My name's Lucinda O'Hanlon. I'm the Head of Policy and Strategy at the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership. We're competing with a lot of noise during this event, and so we're gonna try to rise above it, all right, because this topic is vital for us to discuss. So, and I just don't want you to be distracted by the music and the speakers that are next door. And I hope that if we can be loud enough, we might get some more people in the room to listen to our important speakers today. As His Excellency noted, women and girls are at the forefront of the fight against climate change. Their political activism and activities, for instance, generates more effective and fair climate outcomes from sustainable land management to community-driven sanitation management. And yet, the leadership photo of decision makers at this conference looks like this. Uh, not me, that, that. This needs to change, not as a favor to women to include them, and not as a matter of optics to have more diversity in that photo shoot, but as a matter of necessity, and quite urgent necessity at that. Because without women's leadership, without valuing their solutions and priorities, without involving half of the world in arguably the greatest global challenge of our time, climate change, our solutions will fall dramatically short. We will fail to build the sustainable future that our children and grandchildren deserve. And I think it's important to appreciate that ensuring women's participation and leadership is not merely a matter of equalizing the numbers. There are concrete changes that can be observed when women are in power. Research demonstrates that due to socially prescribed gender roles, women assess risks differently to men and typically prioritize the welfare of their families and communities in resource management decisions. Such differences in decision making extend to and benefit national politics. A 2019 study found that national parliaments with more women pass more stringent climate policies. Empowered women also play a critical role in enabling their societies to adapt more quickly to the effects of climate change and more efficiently fight against it. 
This is the form of people-centered political leadership that is needed to fight against climate change. Another name for this is feminist leadership, which is luckily not a concept that's only available to female leaders. Through feminist leadership, we recognize that women and people of diverse genders, because of the reality of pervasive discrimination, have had to find alternative routes to power. And such approaches emphasize inclusion, transparency, understanding power structures, and intersecting forms of discrimination. And as such, supporting feminist leadership is not only a pathway to gender equality, but towards the achievement of social justice more broadly. Today, we're gonna hear from a group of inspiring women leaders about the work that they're involved in at the intersection of water, sanitation, development, and climate change. We know that those communities who lack access to water and sanitation are also those who are most vulnerable to the devastating impacts of climate change, and thus assuring access to this most basic of services is critical to assuring our green future. But we're never going to be able to do it without women's brains, without their drive, and without their leadership. So that's just to get us started. I want to hand it over now to Mina Guli, uh, who's our keynote speaker. Hi. <laughs> Mina's from Melbourne. She's the founder and CEO of the Thirst Foundation. She's an ultra marathoner and a water champion. Yesterday, she ran the 127th marathon out of 200 in a year-long campaign called Run Blue ahead of the 2023 conference, U United Nations Conference on Water. We're honored to have you with us today, Mina. Over to you. Thanks, Lucinda. Um, I'm going to try and speak loudly so that, um, as Lucinda said, we can rise our voices above the noise that is coming from around us. The world isn't fair. Women earn less. We have fewer opportunities. And even when we do seize them, we often end up crashing into the glass ceilings. But in the world of water, the challenges are even greater. Over the last seven months, as Lucinda mentioned, I've run 127 marathons out of the 200 marathons I've committed to run in the lead up to the United Nations Summit on Water, which is gonna be held in March next year. This is a journey that's taken me to the front lines of the water crisis into homes, villages, factories, farms, offices and boardrooms all across the world. As I've run, I've lost count of the women and girls I've met who've talked to me about water. Women who invited me into their homes, women I walked with on their long journeys to fetch water and who have literally embraced me, pleading, for help to solve this water problem, if not for them, for their daughters and their granddaughters. These women are not statistics on a page. They're real women leading real lives across the world. In Ghana, I watched young girls digging with their bare hands in the dirt, searching for water to drink. In South Africa, I ran through towns that had literally run dry, with girls waiting by the gates to their homes for their daily water delivery instead of going to school. In India, women told me that they were left at home for months, looking after their families and their livestock while their husbands went into the towns to find work, because drought meant that their land could no longer support them. At the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan, where I ran past the hulking steel carcasses of fishing boats that now lie stranded in the desert sands, women came to meet me at what was the old port, begging for help to create economic opportunities for them and their children in a town whose businesses and future had dried up, along with its water. And in northern Kenya, 
women told us of the devastating impact of drought. Low water levels, meaning their walk for water became more treacherous and more difficult. And for one, almost deadly. She had to leave her baby with her young daughter when she went for water. Her baby, her youngest, fell into the fire and suffered traumatic burns to her head and body. These are not statistics. These are real stories of real people. And for these women and the many hundreds of millions like them, water truly is life. It's in stark contrast to the conferences like this. And it's contrary to the conversations in most of the boardrooms and the halls of power around the world where business leaders so often undervalue and overlook water, even when they're talking about issues where water is central, agriculture, energy, climate change, poverty, food security, health, sustainable development, women. Most of us have read the shocking statistics about water insecurity and the even more alarming predictions about how many more women and girls will be impacted by water shortages and the water crisis in the future. Making the incidents that we just talked about above far from isolated. Instead, they're examples. Examples of the horrific way in which our global water crisis is disproportionately impacting women, and girls right across the world. This needs to change. We need to invest in grey and green infrastructure, infrastructure that will transform their lives and the lives of their families and their communities. We need to invest in the toilets and the taps that make a difference to where the young girls can go to school and mean that women no longer risk their lives to fetch water for their families. And we need to invest in our ecosystems, the healthy rivers, lakes and wetlands that provide the water that flows into those taps and that will help the communities that rely on them to adapt to the worsening impacts of climate change and to mitigate the damage caused by extreme floods and droughts. But even more importantly, we need new models of governance, new ways of mobilizing capital that will support and promote the role of women and the leadership they can provide in solving this crisis. We need women to be involved in the decision making, not only to dissect the what of the problem, but the how of the solutions. In Kenya, we went out to one of the local villages and I helped to hand dig a well. Probably didn't do a very good job, but it was an incredible experience. Incredible because it was a coming together of the entire community. Men turning the drill. The elder generation of women cooking food for the workers. And the younger, stronger women forming these incredibly beautiful, colourful lines as they walked with these enormous heavy containers filled to the brim with the rocks and sand that were needed for the construction of the wells. It was an amazing demonstration of unity to build an asset that would change the opportunities available for women and girls living in that community. But the project was led and the well will be managed by men. And here is the problem. Because for all the times I've seen women and girls impacted by the water crisis, I've been shocked at how few I've met in the policy space. Political innovation in water has for far too long been a male-dominated domain, even in WASH. This is not easy. The role of women even more broadly than water in governance is thin at best. So we are fighting a rising tide, but it's a fight we need to have and it's a fight worth having, especially on water. 
So, how do we change this? First, we need to put women onto the boards and into the rooms where decisions are made. We need to be at the table. Second, we need to provide women-specific workforce development training and capacity building. We need to lift up those women so they can be at the table. And third, we need to find creative ways to incentivize the inclusion of women, the linking of funding to their participation, other ways we can support and bring women to the table. This is the enabling environment and we need to make it happen. But ultimately, ultimately we also need to put water onto the global agenda, to galvanize conversations, not only amongst those of us that know and understand the problem, but amongst those that have traditionally been on the periphery of the water debate. Presidents, prime ministers, CEOs and fund managers, people outside the water silo, people from engineering, from mining, from food, from all the other areas that we traditionally exclude from the conversations we have. And that is going to require a concerted effort, not only from all of us here today, but from water activists across the world. For too long, while we've known that water is everything, we've treated it as if it's nothing. We know when that changes, our societies, our economies and our communities benefit. And importantly, so do the women most affected by this water crisis. And it's honestly one of the reasons over the last few years, alongside our running, we've been building a grassroots community of water activists. Thousands and thousands of people from over 197 countries and territories right across the world, stepping up to share their water stories and to demand action, action from leaders right across the world. Many of these people are women and girls coming together to be part of the solution and to inspire others to do the same. Now, it's time for us to step up, to be the leaders and the change makers we need to recruit others, to be, demand to be let in, and to help to set the stage at the UN Summit in 2023, and to put us on the path for concrete actions and solutions that will help to finally even the playing field for women and girls everywhere. Because when we work together, we can truly change the world. Together, we can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amina, for those inspiring words, for the vivid reminder that the water crisis has a human face, and in fact, it's a woman's face, for giving us specific ways forward to uplift women's voices in order to increase access to water and sanitation, and for reminding us that this is about garnering political will. At SWA, we like to say that we need to reach out and we need to reach up. We need to get across sectors and we need to reach those highest level decision makers to help them see why water and sanitation is so important. And thanks also for us putting the UN Summit on our radar screen as a critical opportunity uh, for us to move forward and keep up the momentum. I'm going to move now to our panel and I'd like to welcome our distinguished panelists. Uh, you have them here, but I'll just quickly introduce them. We have Dedo Mate Kojo, from the Pan Africa Program Manager from WaterAid. We have Brenda uh, Mowale, the COO of the Green Girls Platform. We have Nita Pokrel, the Chief of, water, of the Water Sector Group from the Asia Development Bank. And we have Sarah Beardmore, Team Lead for Strategic Partnerships and Capabilities at the Global Partners Partnership for Education. Dear panelists, I'm going to start with the same question for all of you, and then we're going to get into more of a fluid discussion. What are some of the most exciting women-led initiatives that you're currently following? 
what's really inspiring you at the moment? And Nita, I'm going to begin with you. Do you have a microphone? Testing. Works. OK, thank you, Lucinda. Um, thank you, Mina. Very inspiring. Um, and thank you also from my, you know, from Asia Pacific region where two billion uh, people still do not have water and sanitation access. We are also the region where we are most disaster impacted in the world. Um, and I think we all know this is a learned community here. It is the human face of women. Disasters uniquely impact us. Climate change is impacting us more. And water and sanitation need not, I need not say it is our business. We are there fetching water, especially in Asia Pacific region on average. We spend four hours fetching water and collecting firewood still. So at the Asian Development Bank, we have no choice but to really be at it, at it in our policies, at it in our projects, and demand more, and that's precisely what we're doing. I want to also talk about a personal story and a, and a project story, because I think we're we all about storytelling here, and really, it cuts across the blah, right? So personal story, uh, when I was working as an engineer 27 years ago, in a developed country, not a developing country. Uh, my foreman refused to work with me and said to my project manager, it was a wastewater treatment plant just two hours away from Sydney, um, said, could you give us a real engineer? And my project manager, bless him, said, she's all we've got, mate. You want to get paid, you have to deal with her. Bless him, we need to create leaders, project managers like that. Another example, a project in Nepal, we call it Small Towns Water Supply and Sanitation Project. When we started, um, we demanded that the, the water user committee that will govern the project and will define the design and the implementation of the project have at least 33% women, you know, that was what was in the constitution for local uh, governance structures. But we also demanded that they must have a leadership position, either the chair, the vice chair, or the treasurer, because many a times we see they put women and they accountants and, you know, they don't have leadership role. So we gave the choice, but we demanded, and it took a year of negotiation to say, no, we really can't do this. And what happened now, local elections in Nepal came, and the women who were running these water and sanitation schemes at the leadership positions were the women who, who ran for elections, and they won. So this is what we are about. We need to put our foot down to say we will do investment projects differently, not blind investment projects that Mina talked about. You know, we have uh, infrastructure projects where it really doesn't reach out to the ones who are the biggest users. Policy makers, programs that will go deeper and really make people feel uncomfortable. But it will be the ones that will have largest impacts. So I will stop here, but I have plenty of more examples to give you, Lucinda. Thank you, Nita. And we're going to come back to you for more examples, so uh, keep a hold of them. Brenda, I'm coming to you next uh, for some uh, reflections on, on what has you excited at the moment from the work that you're doing in Malawi. All right, thank you so much for having me here. So I work with Green Girls Platform, and Green Girls Platform is a female-led organization, and we work with girls and young women and uh, their involvement in the climate space um, arena. So this is like the first female-led organization in Malawi, and then we realized that we don't really have that platform where women and girls can actually be able to express themselves and actually take that responsibility to be in the forefront, being like the most, um, the group of people that are mostly impacted by the impacts of climate change. So this is where um, Green Girls Platform came in. And what we do is that we provide capacity building workshops and mentorship programs, both in schools, um, urban areas, we reach out to women and girls in rural communities. What we want to build is that we know that um, our policies really doesn't give the platform where women and girls can actually be involved, more especially in WASH projects. So what we're trying to do is that we don't want to be that voice for them. We 
want people to, we want them to be their own voices. We want them to be their own faces, whereby they can be able to speak for, th for themselves, whereby people can get to know what, how are they being impacted? How can they be actively involved in the um, wash and climate change, Alena? And then what, um, in, in, in so doing, we, we know that there's that communication gap where a lot of people don't really know the existing policies. And then how can we ensure that even those in rural communities can be able to know these are the policies that are there. And this is how we can be able to advocate for them, like for ourselves. So we do conduct like policy learning sessions in communities. We know that the policies are not in our local languages where even like those in communities can be able to learn. So we do uh, policy learning sessions. And then after doing that, we do mentorship projects. And we want, uh, the approach that we do is the demand-driven approach. They know the, 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 the challenges that they're facing in the communities. And we don't want to go there and tell them to say, these are the challenges that you're facing. We want them to tell us, what are the challenges that they're facing? What is it they want, that they want to be um, done in their communities? How can they, we make sure that their communities are like climate resilient communities? And then once, they are all like, well, once we empower them, we want them to be able to advocate, even at local level. Because we know there are like different funds that are given at local level. And then those funds are never directed to like wash projects, uh, environmental conservation projects. And we want them to be empowered and be able to stand and be that voice that they want in their communities. So basically, that's what we're doing um, at Green Dots Platform. It's fantastic, Brenda. And we're going to come back to hear more about your work as well. But we, we've heard about empowerment. We've heard from Nita that this is about more than just wash and how... Uh, oh. Is that better? Okay. Uh, we've heard from Nita also about it's, it brings benefits in WASH, but it also extends beyond to the larger community. Sarah, I'm coming to you next. What has you really excited at the moment? What's making you feel inspired? Thanks, Lucinda. Well, I think first I'm really inspired by Brenda. Um, just really amazed by, by your, your work. And I think, in fact, for me, the climate crisis and g the gender equality crisis really come from the same root cause. And this is the mentality that commodifies life, that allows extraction to be a one-way thing, that says exploitation of our resources and our life systems is okay. You know, that turns a woman's body into property, just like it turns the water into property. And so to me, I think the most inspiring work is the work that is really trying to change that mindset shift that we need. We work in education, and so that's really at the heart of, of what we're trying to do at the Global Partnership for Education. Um, we're working with uh, a, a young uh, youth leader in northern Kenya, and um, honestly, she's one of my biggest heroes. She's Maasai. Um, she was going to be married as a child until a donor came and built a school in her community. She then went to school and went on to establish an agricultural project in her community that now teaches everyone in her community about indigenous plants, medicinal plants, drought-resistant crops, and is there to help build the resilience. So when we educate a girl, and when we get the community around her to support what she's doing, the changes can be massive. Right now in her community, though, they're facing an unprecedented drought. And girls are dropping out of school. Why? Because they have to walk farther to go get water. So we are really at the front lines of the crisis. And it's clear that we are only going to tackle the girls' education crisis and the climate crisis if we do that together. Some of the other work we're supporting, we have a fund that, that invests in advocacy and accountability in all of the partner countries where we work. And there's amazing work being done by national education coalitions to help ensure that there are no laws preventing pregnant girls from going back to school. And during COVID, that's been one of the number one reasons for school dropout. During school closures, girls were forced into transactional sex to raise funds because of economic livelihoods being destroyed. And then they're not allowed to go back to school. So that's the kind of discriminatory policy that continues to keep girls from getting the education they need to rise out of poverty to be able to help their families. Um, there's another amazing example from Amplify Girls. They're working at a, a community level in Rwanda, Learn, Work, 
develop in 39 villages. And they've got a bunch of aunties that they've assigned to girls. And these aunties make sure that those girls have what they need to stay in school. And then they advocate in their, in their villages to make sure that other girls go to school and that there is support at the kind of cultural level for, for girls getting an education and completing their degrees. I mean, that kind of solidarity, that kind of women-to-women -women peer support, women at the front lines making sure that young women and girls are given the same opportunities as young boys and men, I think that's, that's going to change the tide of both the empowerment of education uh, as, a, as a mindset shift for climate justice and for equality. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, also for helping us see the interconnectedness of all of these issues that we can't just uh, hone in on any one sector when it comes to gender equality. It needs to be across the board. Uh, Dedo, over to you. What's, what's got you feeling good these days about women's leadership? What are you excited about? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucinda. Um, water Aid has been working in the water and sanitation uh, sphere for the last 40 years. Um, and I do recall the very first um, Earth Summit 30 years ago, where um, in Ghana we actually did a documentary on hand dug wells and how you know, communities were helping dig hand dug wells um, as a documentary to the Earth Summit. But over, over the last 30, 40 years, we have moved into developing models uh, of you know, work at the community level. We've looked at system strengthening and linking what's happening at community level with what should happen at local government. One of the key examples of you know, women-led initiatives would definitely be the, the work that we've done with some partners in addressing the scientific knowledge or scientific addition to local knowledge on how to adapt to climate change. This has primarily been in working with the women and men, of course, to address uh, water level changes. So monitoring what is happening in the surface water, monitoring what is happening in the borehole yield, and monitoring the water levels in the dams. Why? Because as some of my colleagues have already mentioned, when there's water stress, there's conflict. It impacts on water for household use. It impacts on water for livelihoods. And it impacts on water for construction. A lot of the construction in our villages has a lot of water. So by training the women in using the meteorological systems <laughs> to, to monitor the water levels, the data is collected and then some analysis is, ha is done together with the local authority, community members, and decisions are made as to which borehole can be used for what and who has access to the dam. And you know, is it for livestock? Is it for construction? Is it for household use? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In addition, we have, we have helped the women to develop market gardens. Market gardens using the run of water from the, from the boreholes, using part of the, the, the dams uh, to develop not just any crop, but indi indigenous crops. So I think I heard earlier on, you know, indigenous crops, crops that, you know, through uh, crops which previously were, you know, handpicked from the bush, women are now, now have access to grow that. And to tell you, you know, it's not just growing the crops, but also they have been trained in using uh, compost, to make compost, local compost. So the compost goes back into the soil. Of course, it has better yield. And we all know that um, having, introducing organic matter into the soil helps retain water. So in a cyclic way, these women are actually addressing climate change in their own little way. Another example I'd like to give is our work in Bangladesh, where you know, women have been trained to understand reverse on osmosis and to manage a system that, has, that provides them with clean drinking water at the community level. Water is sold, it is uh, well, sold as a nominal fee, and the money is used for other development in the community. Now, these two examples are examples of where water 
is scarce. But in Sierra Leone, where there's too much water, too much water that gets contaminated during the rains, we have helped women build the capacity to manage the boreholes at the community level. And so, bit by bit, uh, train, the pe train the women to, well, to repair the, bo the boreholes at the community level so that they now, you know, the, 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 they don't use the, the uh, groundwater that's contaminated, but re-diverting to the borehole use. So in a nutshell, we have women taking leadership, uh, taking leadership at the community level for what happens to water that they use, water that they can, you know, water that they use for household and community decisions around what else happens to water for the whole, for the rest of the community. Thank you. Dedo, thank you so much. And to all of you for getting us started with some of those stories. And we're gonna go deeper into them to understand why all of this matters so much. What difference does it make when you put women in leadership positions? Brenda, I wanna come back to you. Uh, the Green Girl platform is doing really important work in Malawi. And what impact are you seeing on women and girls' life with the lives, with the uh, actions that you were describing before? How are things changing as a result of mentorship programs, as a result of bottom-up approaches, uh, right? Starting with the demands of the community. Can you say more about that, please? All right, thank you so much for that. So um, one of the projects that I'm really proud of that Green Girls Platform is doing is the creation of self spaces in schools and communities. Because I know like the impacts of climate change, you only, we always led them to like the physical impacts, but then we always feel like um, the impacts are also mentally um, like affecting people. And then for women, it's layer to actually have like that platform where you can be able to like vent or even be able to uh, grieve because like the impacts you find that um, maybe their, their houses are washed away. Um, maybe uh, the houses are destroyed. Their crops are, uh, are washed away and they don't have anything. But still more in the midst of all that scarcity, you find that they still have to be strong for their communities, for their children, for their families. But they don't really have that platform where they can be able to get to know that they are not alone. They can be able to um, share experiences with other people. Because sometimes when you let out whatever you're going through, sometimes it helps to, like it's a healing process also. So it's not just about, okay, we need, we need, um, we, we have to do a frustration, we have to do this. I mean, there's no way you can be going to someone's house and tell them to say, you have to start planting trees when they're mentally affected. I mean, you also have to make sure that their mental well-being is also um, like a priority. So that's what one thing that we've, we as Green Girls Platform, we've been prioritizing, and it's really helping because we've actually seen women opening up. Like we're going to communities where um, like a hundred of people have died because of the cyclones. I mean, how do you approach that person to tell them to say, oh, we need to start um, planting trees. We need to make sure that uh, we, we, we vent into um, uh, irrigation processes. I mean, we have to make sure that even their mental well-being is, 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 um, is taken care of. And at the very same time also, uh, with like the mentor we were doing the, it was just like a pilot phase of the Young Women Negotiators Project be because what we, we've seen is that yes, at global level we need negotiators, but then who is going to keep them accountable for like all the commitments that our countries are coming up with? All the commitments that country we see our governments making here at COP. Who is going to make them accountable at grassroots level? Because we don't want them to just like submit policies to just come up with like uh, those commitments. But then we need action. We need to see their action plans. For example, last year we've seen countries um, submitting their NDCs. But then who is going to make sure that the NDCs are actually put into action? Are we just waiting for the next five years whereby okay, countries now are coming up with like reviews of the NDCs? Who is going to make sure that that's um, that's actually being implemented on the grassroots level? That's so this is why we're coming up with like, we came up with the mentorship program and then we have like different women negotiators who are actually here are negotiating like top uh, lead, lead negotiators in Malawi. And then they're the ones who are like mentoring them, giving them the capacity building to say they can even do that at grassroots level. They can even keep our, our, our leaders uh, accountable at grassroots level. And for the first time, um, yeah, last year I participated uh, in COP, but for the first time we've actually have two uh, of our participants attending COP this time around. 
And yeah, they're inside the negotiation room. So this is why they did attend. But I would lead it up if they were here so that you can see them and maybe also share the experiences of how it, uh, it's, it's been going. And then we had another um, advocacy campaign uh, in Salima, which is one of the areas where it's highly uh, impacted by, it has been highly impacted by floods. And then we did our advocacy campaign in, in Salima where we wanted to see the ge uh, implementation of gender mainstreaming in the climate change management policy. Um, gender, for gender mainstreaming is there, it's just mentioned, but it's like on the ground, it's not being implemented. So what we wanted to do is to make sure that uh, even them, like at grassroots level, the women, like they have never been in school, but they can actually be able to craft their stories, be able to share their stories, be able to see, like uh, make our policy um, makers get to know, understand why gender mainstreaming is very important and um, in the implementation of like our climate change manage, uh, in the um, implementation of our different projects. And at the very same time also, uh, we've been doing green entrepreneurship. I'm saying uh, we go in communities, we, we get to understand what are some of the impacts that they're facing, and then what exactly is it that they want. And we have like women in Karonga, in the, the northern part of Malawi. For them, they want to uh, venture into afforestation because that's something that they want. And with that, because it's something that they want, we see, we're seeing sustainability because we don't have to be there all the time. They're able to make networks. They are able to like contact the forestry officer in the district to make sure that they're doing And this year, they've been able to plant 10,000 tree seedlings and the, the seeds, the, the trees are still like now, they are still alive because we don't want to just do trees, uh, tree planting and then next year it's only five trees that have survived. We want to make sure that like the projects that we're doing are sustainable and we have another team um, in Salima that they want to venture into climate smart agriculture and they are like it because I'm one of the farmers also. I do farming so <laughs> for that it's like oh wow um, I'm going to be your person and uh, what are we trying to do? Yes, during the rainy season, there are floods. But then, does that mean that throughout the year, they have to be, they, they have to stay without food? I mean, this is where we have to encourage them to um, plant organic, uh, or to do organic farming. The, uh, how can we make sure that they're able to make compost manure? Uh, how can we do that? And because I'm, like, it's, it's my field now. I, I always make sure that I'm there and make sure that they're empowered and they know what to do. And we know what kind of plants to, to plant depending with like their, their locality. And at the same time also, okay, <laughs> okay. All right, so we have, okay, last three, um, we have those that are now making briquettes because we know, um, yes, the government said, okay, no more use of firewood, but then what are the alternatives that are available? So we're trying to empower them, not just to use them in their houses, but they can also sell the briquettes and make a living out of it. So. So far, I think that's what I can share. I can go on and on, but. There is so much to share, Brenda, and so many points there that I wanted to go even deeper into. So I'm sorry to cut you short, um, but I, but I want to leave time for the others as well. I want to go back to your first point, though, the, the issue of self-care and making sure that we look at the whole woman, not just creating more work, for women who are already on the front lines, who are already leading in their communities, how do we make sure we take care of them, uh, body, mind, and soul? Uh, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you now, uh, right as you're having a sip of water. Um, education is such a vital socioeconomic driver of climate resilience and action. Can you tell us more about how the Global Partnership on Education is working to ensure that gender equality is at the heart of education? Sure, thanks Lucinda. Um, so the Global Partnership for Education is the world's largest partnership and fund devoted to getting every child a quality education in the world's lower income countries. So we work in about 83 countries around the world. Um, and our approach is really to support system transformation, uh, working with ministries and partners on the ground to both invest in education, but also to make sure that the policies are coherent and that gender is really hardwired into everything that we do. Um, and we really do that because we know that education is a critical enabler of human rights and particularly in overcoming inequality. Um, so we have a number of different approaches. Um, First of all, we have about $4 billion that we've mobilized to invest in education over the next five years. Um, 
we first start with a gender responsive education sector policy approach. So we look across all of the education policies and ensure that they are really um, integrating gender consideration as a lens across everything that we do. We also have a fund called the Girls Education Accelerator. So countries with very high inequality, we give additional money to incentivize targeted programs as well as mainstream programs to make sure that, that girls' education is really at the heart of the change they're seeking. We also have a $72 million fund for civil society advocacy and accountability. Uh, gender is hardwired into all of that and all of our grantees have to have uh, gender uh, responsive lens on everything they do. The coalitions we work with have to include women and girls led organizations. Um, so really from top to bottom, the Global Partnership for Education makes sure that gender is really at the heart of, of our education strategies. Um, we're also moving now into realizing that we're not gonna be able to achieve a quality education for every child unless we take a step back and look at the increasing intensifying impacts of climate change on education systems. Um, you know, in Malawi, there were back-to-back -back cyclones that destroyed schools, washed away textbooks. I mean, when you're constantly having to rebuild from extreme weather events, there's no way that you can improve the quality and ensure that access is guaranteed. So at the Global Partnership for Education, we're also working to design what we're calling a climate smart education system framework. And really what that is is synthesizing all of the entry points from infrastructure to sector policy and planning to the curriculum and teachers to community and school linkages, trying to understand where and how we can make sure that there is resilience built in, but also that education's power as a force for climate action is unleashed. Starting next year, we're gonna be working to also roll out a partnership to provide technical assistance to ministries of education to help them integrate climate change considerations into their education sector policies, plans, and budgets, and also to support more effective cross-sectoral dialogue between ministries of education and environment and climate and agriculture, and finally to make sure that we're actually looking at cross-sectoral programming. We have education funds and we have climate funds and we need to be working together because these are cross-sectoral challenges. Um, as, as you said before, you know, the, the water issues affect girls' access to education, affect uh, agriculture, affect children's nutrition to be able to be in school and learn. So all of these pieces touch one another. And we're here to help ministries really work together to make sure that we have an aligned, comprehensive, and holistic approach to tackling the problem. For, for also uh, concluding on that note of we're in this together and it, we have to find ways to band together to find solutions to these common problems. Uh, Dato, I'm coming to you next. If you could tell us more about the work of WaterAid to support women-led initiatives and what results are you seeing from that work? Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to focus on another aspect of the lack of water and specifically looking at the work that we've been doing in water and sanitation and hygiene in um, healthcare facilities. I think all the reports that we have read talks about damage to healthcare facilities through because of the torrential rain, flooding, et cetera, et cetera. But the Joint Monitoring Report of UNICEF also tells us that one in five healthcare facilities do not have access to water. And that out of that, about 1.8 billion people have access to healthcare facilities that do not have water. So can you imagine what this implies for newborn health, for pregnant women seeking healthcare, for even the workers seeking, uh, workers providing healthcare facilities. So over the last seven to 10 years, WaterAid has been working on what we've called the Healthy Start. And Healthy Start by its very name talks about newborn health being able to provide water and sanitation facilities at healthcare facilities so that, you know, give children, newborn babies a, a good start to life, having water for delivery, water for the mother, water for the midwife, water for all those who attend the healthcare facilities in order to be to wash, and, uh, wash their hands and use, you know, practice personal hygiene. So what have we been able to do? 
again, working with partners in the local, local government, we have made uh, hybrid syst water systems, dug boreholes to bring water closer to the, to, the, to the healthcare facility, instituted or installed solar powered pumping systems so that no one actually has to go and fetch water to bring to the center for a, for a mother who's having a baby. So that is done. We're providing um, desegregated uh, bathroom facilities for clients to the healthcare centers as well as the workers. But we have also linked up the water system to the community and to the schools so that, you know, holistically, there's water availability for community members to be able to practice good hygiene and for schools where we know without water, girls are extra challenged when it's time, when, it, when the menstrual cycle is due. But one of the things which, you know, um, in addition to that, sorry, we've also provided some training, capacity building to community members. We are calling it rooted advocacy or indigenous uh, approach where building again on community skills, community negotiation skills. We provided them with the wherewithal so they can make demands to the local authority to improve, sit to improve situations in their centers. And I know that in a couple of situations in Northern Ghana, we've been able, the people have themselves have demanded, you know, the renewal or refurbishment of the healthcare center to prevent mosquitoes when women are, women are there. In other cases as well, women themselves have been part, have been part of the training for latrine construction, uh -huh, to providing additional skills to the women. And I know that in Mali, through this training as well, women have been able to be part of the healthcare management system, healthcare management system, committee, committee. Um, so, so then they have a say in what is happening at the healthcare and can comment on the quality of care that they receive. Thank you so much for those examples. And then also bringing in that health aspect. I think, again, emphasizing how interconnected all of these things are. Nita, it's your turn to say more specifically about what ADB is doing to support uh, on water and sanitation, but specifically why women's leadership is so paramount in this area. Over to you. Thank you, Lucinda. I think. Um, my fellow panelists have really illustrated already when you do not have women involved in planning, design, delivery, uh, and, and in ADB actually we go post completion. I think we're the only multilateral development bank who go and rate ourselves at the completion of the project. How did we do it? And we put it in our corporate target indicators. So for all our projects, all water projects, 90% of it has, you know, starts with the gender action plan. We involve, we go beyond the, some of the examples I gave to say, it's not about is it gender mainstream anymore, because it really is gender mainstream already. Are we going deeper? Are we really using those as leverage points to make further leadership policy impacts? And then coming back to say, how did we do over our average um, project period is seven years. Uh, our running water sector portfolio is $20 billion. How did our $20 billion of on the ground presence leverage and create better and deeper and longer impacts to make it sustainable? Um, and without having th those um, uh, leadership interwoven into it, and it's also the participation so the design is appropriate. I think we talked about design not being appropriate. So the full cycle uh, of women's involvement um, in, in uh, defining uh, what the project would be, defining what the lessons learned would be then interwoven into the next project, next policy intervention that do is very important. And again, if you don't do that, you're not creating it for the communities that you're building. So our um, uh, focus always is how do we go beyond ADB projects to the partners like WaterAid, uh, FCDO, uh, everybody uh, that, that we could to leverage and, and put it into the budget books, put it into the policies that can cascade further. Um, that's where we at, and I don't know if I've really answered your questions because I'm looking at the time also. 
So <laughs> we are running over time. And thank you, Anita. You're doing a better job than I am at keeping track of the time. <laughs> no, no, because I'm just going, you said three minutes, and I'll just stick to three minutes. <laughs> No, thank you for that, Nita. And also this emphasizing that the design is the key, that including women and gender equality, it's not a garnish that you add at the end. It's the fundamental ingredient for success. So thank you for that. I, I know we're over time, but we also started five minutes late. And so with your permission, I want to do one last rapid fire. What gives you hope for the future in three words? Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, um, partnerships. Uh, I really see a lot of us uh, speaking three words. I'm going to now, because I, I stuck to my three minutes per question, I'm going to take more <laughs> words. Um, the momentum, you know, I, I've been here a week. Today's my last day. It was Water and Gender Day. And it's very apt. Today was Water and Gender Day. And I'm going home with that hope that they've actually done for the first time water and then they put gender with us. Um, it is going to, the f best pavilion I've seen is youth and children. It is full of energy, it's full of probing, and it's not blah anymore. The rest of us, I feel, are, are still mired in you know, the, the policies and blah. So that hope, the children, the participation, the futuristic outlook, and interweaving what I think all of us said uh, the realization that it is one common problem and the behaviors uh, of policy makers, actors on the ground is what is going to cut it. More worse than three and I pass it over to Dedo. Thank you very much. I think for me, the, my parting shot would be, you know, Nita talked about the linkages and partnerships between what's happening at co community level, lower level, and there are lots of wonderful examples of innovation, innovations that women have, have led on that needs to feed into national policy. How can we do that? But having Nita here with us today, I think we should be able to think through the, the different levels through which we need to harness the, the, the power of these initiatives into national level policy and practice and budget and funding and finance. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, in three words, what gives me hope? Um, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I think the amount of grassroots innovation that is bubbling up right now is immense. And what gives me hope is actually that we're building allies across institutions from top to bottom so that while grassroots innovation is coming up, we also have governments and people like us working with governments to help scale those innovations, really take them nationally. Um, and I think that this is a force that can't be put back in the bottle. So we're here and we're here to stay. Thanks, Sarah. Over to you, Brenda. A couple of last words, please. Okay, um, what gives me hope is uh, the meaningful, inclusive and diversified participation of women in everything and not tokenistic approach, so, yeah. yeah. I think that's a great thing to end on. Let's get beyond the tokenistic approaches. We're talking about partnerships, about connecting across sectors. I, I wanna go back to the picture that we started with, uh, because I, I think it's important that we keep thinking about what that picture looks like and what it would take for that picture to change. We need to change that. What will it take what do we need our leaders to do? We need them to listen to people like Brenda. We need them to uplift the voices of youth, of women. And we need them to move over for a new wave of feminist leadership, uh, which is led by all of the women that you've been talking about today and women like you. <laughs> Mer I'm going to finish. Mary Robinson has said on many occasions, but she said it today as well, Climate change is a man-made solution, a man-made problem with a feminist solution. And I hope that we can all remember that and take this agenda forward. Thank you. <laughs>